Right. We're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about a new campaign. I'm going to talk about how we can stop the nuclear industry now and all of this, all of these releases to the environment using existing European law. So we can do this in Europe anyway. Now, this uh, European law is the Euratom Basic Safety Standards Directive 96-29. And in fact, this has been updated to the Euratom 2013-59 Directive which uh, which makes the case that I'm about to to talk to you about even stronger. Now, in the uh, in the Euratom 9629 directive, the, uh, we advised my colleagues and I went went to Brussels in 1998, and we advised the European um, Greens about the new directive, which at that time said that you could. Uh, do all sorts of crazy stuff like dilute radioactive waste into consumer goods and so forth. But one of the things that we suggested they did, and in fact was carried out, was to introduce a suicide clause to the directive, which is European law. Now, in all of the science fiction stories, if you create a robot or a monster that can turn on you and kill you, a big complicated machine that is also intelligent, you have, to, you have to have some way of pulling the plug on it. You have to have some way in which you can stop it if it sort of goes mad, right? And so this is what they did with the Euratom Directive. They included a clause that meant that they could shut it down if it, if it looked like it wasn't working. Now, I'm going to read this. This is a, Article 6 from the, 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 the Euratom Directive. It says, Member states shall ensure that all new classes or types of practice resulting in exposure to ionizing radiation are justified in advance of being first adopted or first approved by their economic, social or other benefits in relation to the health detriment they may cause. So that's fair enough. They have to be justified, and I'll explain what that is. But then, then uh, number two, subsection two says, existing classes or types of practice may be reviewed as to justification whenever new and important evidence about their efficacy or consequences is acquired. So what this is saying is that if we find out, or if, if it's sh shown as a result of new research that they got it wrong, then the whole of the, uh, all of the practices involving radiation exposure have to be re-justified. Right. So what is meant by justified? Now justification is, is, is primary when you're going to produce something which, can, which, which has, a, has, has a, a harmful effect on people. Okay? Because obviously you have to justify killing people on the basis that you gain something out of killing them. Right? Now you may think this is a bit insane, but this is actually how it works. This is the justification aspect of all radiation exposures. So let's see what this means in reality. Now the current radiation risk uh, legal limit is one millisievert. Okay? Well, you can go along to the, the risk model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection or more easily to the uh, American Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation Committee 7 report. And you will see what, what, what they say is that if you've got one millisievert, it will cause the, the it will produce one cancer in, um, one millisievert will produce one cancer in uh, 100,000 people. Right? Is that right? Hang on, let's just get this right. Make sure that I've got this right. Because I'm going to talk about what this actually means, you see. Um, right, 10,000. Okay? So, according to the current risk model, one millisievert will cause one cancer in 10,000 people. Now, you may say that's very little, and so they justify the development of nuclear energy on the basis of a law that allows them to kill one, well, to produce cancer in, in, uh, in one person in 10,000 people that's exposed to one millisievert. And they could do this every year. But let's see what that really means. If we take Paris as an example, 
In Paris, there are about, in Greater Paris, there are about 10 million people. So you can calculate on the basis of this that if you expose those 10 million people to one millisievert, and that's the law, you can do this, that is the law, it's been justified. It's been justified that you can expose the population of Paris to one, milli, to one millisievert. That would cause 1,050 extra cancers, according to this model. You know, they accept this, this is their model. 1,050 extra cancers, uh, and at the current cancer uh, mortality to incidence ratio, that means about 630 people will die in Paris as, as a result of one millisievert exposure. Now, that means that the nuclear industry, or at least this law, is in fact killing more people in Paris than were killed by the terrorist attacks there. And of course it's not just Paris, it's, it's everywhere. So you can do the same calculation for London, population 8.6 million, uh, and there you would have 850 cancer diagnoses and 510 cancer deaths every year. That's permitted. They've justified it. That's the justification. Anyway, the point is that I want to make now is that actually that justification is, is, is quite wrong because, because the number of people that are going to die is a lot larger than that. Now, how do we know that? And, what, and, and, how, and how, can we, how can we do something about it? Well, first of all, we know that because there's an enormous amount of evidence that's emerged since this Euratom Directive in 1996, published in the peer review literature from Chernobyl, from the children who get leukemia around nuclear sites, from people in northern Sweden who, who, um, who were exposed to Chernobyl radiation, uh, and all of the work that was done by Professor Alexey Yablokov and by those people in Belarus, Bandashevsky and people, and also by, pe uh, by, uh, by, by people who worked on the heritable effects, that's the congenital malformations that occurred after Chernobyl in Europe. And all of this has been published. In fact, the Chernobyl uh, congenital effects paper was published by Inga schmitz Feuerhacker, Professor schmitz Feuerhacker, and myself in, uh, in January 2016. And it's all up there on the, on the Internet, but it's been completely ignored by the regulators. Now, all of this stuff was put into the, into the court case in, uh, uh, of the test veterans in the sum summer, this last summer, ju ju uh, June the 13th to July the 5th. And the judge still hasn't made a decision on that six months later. But, but we, the evidence that we submitted was not only that evidence, but it was also evidence about the basis for all of the risk model uh, that exists at the moment. And this basis is the Japanese A-bomb survivor studies. There's what's called the lifespan studies, the LSS. So, after, uh, so first of all, you need to know that the entire risk model, that is to say how many cancers are caused by how many millisieverts, the, the, the calculation that I've just gone through for Paris, the justification calculation, you know, we can kill this number of people because we get all sorts of nuclear power, energy, and we can make bombs and all the rest of it. This is the balancing that's being done in order to justify stuff. Uh, the evidence that came into this court case, brought in by, by Inga and by Soji Sawada and, and you know, various other people, um, revealed something completely unknown, hitherto unknown, well, except by very few people, and most of them crooks. And that is that this lifespan study was dishonestly manipulated in 1973. Now, a, a, a paper was written about this by a bloke called Bertrand Jordan, and he wrote a paper in a, in, a, in a quite a prestigious American journal called Genetics, published by the American Genetics Society, uh, about the Hiroshima studies and how these Hiroshima studies showed that basically, you know, radiation was not as dangerous as most people thought it was. And, and he was complaining in this uh, paper that he wrote, this review paper, he was complaining that, that, ordin that the public don't seem to understand that all of the knowledge about radiation is now finished. We know about it because of the studies from, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But what we found in the court case uh, evidence, and, and we presented in the court, was that the, the, current, the common belief of how that study works, that one, the Hiroshima study, how it works, is actually incorrect. Uh, originally it started off okay. What they did was they compared the people who were at Hiroshima at the time of the bomb, bang, there they all are standing around the place and they've got irradiated, lots of radiation, various doses and so forth. They compared the cancer rate in those over their lifespan, brought forward, and they're still doing this, 
with the people who were not in the city. Now, that's a reasonable epidemiological study. You can argue about whether or not the Japanese survivors were, were, were a, a, an appropriate population if we're going to then take that forward and look at people in Western Europe. You can do that because they have different cancer rates for different types of cancers and all sorts of arguments that Alice Stewart used to do. But the fundamental epidemiological study was okay. You take some people who are exposed and you compare them to people who used to live in Hiroshima but actually were away at the time of the, of the bombing and then they came in afterwards. So they haven't been exposed to the initial explosion radiation and they, these people have. So you compare those two. Now, by 1973, they did compare that enough evidence was in to, in, the com in that comparison to discover that actually it showed that there were quite a lot of cancers in the people who were exposed, you see, but particularly in the low dose group. So, the people who were running the show, it was an American funded operation called the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and later it was called the Radiation Effects Research Foundation. These people threw out the, the controls. They said, we're not going to use these controls f who weren't in the city at the time of the bomb because they were too healthy. Now, you know, can you imagine? This is an epidemiological study. They get an answer and they don't like it, so they throw away the controls. This is what they did. This really happened. And it was written down in their internal journal, which eventually I managed to get through from some people in America. It's very hard to dig into this stuff. Um, and so we found that this had happened. But other people knew that it had happened as well. And, and in particular, a chap called Wan Atabe, a Japanese guy, in 2009, thought, well, hang on. All right, so we can't use those controls. We're going to use a different set of controls that weren't in the city. So we're going to compare the A-bomb survivors, the ones who got all the dose. We're going to compare them with people who lived in, a, in an adjacent uh, community, so in a, in a different um, prefecture next door. Okay? So he did that. And when he did that, and this has also been published in 2008, it was published, you can dig it all out, um, you find that there was a 33% excess risk of cancer in men in, in, in the lowest dose group. That is to say, the dose group at Hiroshima that were like, had only 5 millise 0 to 5 millisieverts of exposure. And not only that, there was other evidence given in the in the in the in the test vets case by by Professor Soji Sawada. What he was look, what he did was he looked at people uh, in terms of their epilation and diarrhea. So these are direct immediate deterministic effects of the of the radiation. So their hair falls out, okay, and they get all sorts of rashes and they get diarrhea and so on. And they sort of know what doses you need to do to get this, and they're quite high, about seven hundred millisieverts. You know, not small doses. But he found, looking at the official data, that people were getting these effects who lived more than six kilometers away from the explosion. So in other words, it was nothing to do with the radiation, because that doesn't go six kilometers from the bomb, that size of bomb, 15 kilotons. Not enough gamma radiation gets six kilometers from the epicenter to have any effect whatever. So something else was causing this, and what was causing it, he said, and we believe, and was more or less shown to be the case in court, was the black rain. So in other words, people were exposed to radioactivity that fell out, rained out after the explosion. Okay, back to Jordan. Now, Jordan didn't know this. Jordan actually said, oh, well, you know, it's like we, we, we look at people who were exposed and we compare them to people who weren't exposed, who weren't in the city. He was wrong. He was wrong. So I got quite irritated about this. So I wrote a letter to the editors of this journal, and I said, look here, you know, this is just wrong. And they, to my astonishment, because normally what happens if I write to people who, who, have, uh, who publish this kind of stuff, you know, who are, you know, very difficult to access, and of course they all think I'm a nutcase because of Monbio and because I get attacked by the nuclear industry all the time through, through, all, or through, through Wikipedia and through various oper black operations on the internet and all the, ra and all the rest of it. Um, anyway, they, these American Genetics uh, Society people said, yeah, sure, look, why don't you write a paper about this or a letter, you know, running through all of this evidence, and we'll send it to three reviewers, and, and if, they, if they say it's okay, if they pass it, we'll publish it, see? Well, I was astonished. I mean, this is how science should work. Science should work like this. So there should be, a, you know, discussion between people who think this is the case and people who think it's not the case. You bring forward evidence and you make the decision about whether it is or isn't the case. This is science. This is how it should be. Of course, it hasn't been like that for a long time. 
And so I did that, and it got published. The reviewers said, yeah, okay, this is fine. They asked for some elaboration on various points that I'd made, so I elaborated these points and so forth, and eventually, on the 1st of December, it was published. Uh, now, the work by Juan Atabe can be translated into an error in the ICRP risk model of about 150 times. So, in other words, if we, t if we translate this through to justification in, in Paris... Instead of, what did I say, 600 people dying of cancer in Paris as a result of a legal dose of one millisievert, it's 150 times 600. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that in my head. It, it's quite a big, well, actually, I think I did do it anyway. The computer's died. Anyway, you're talking like lots of thousands of, of, of people, hundreds of thousands of death, deaths every year from cancer, from legal exposures. Well, you can't have this. You can't have a society where you've got a, a process which is killing hundreds of thousands of people. It's not, it's not, well, I mean, well, they have got it, in fact, but, you know, it's wrong. So, what we can do about this, well, what can we do about this? We can invoke this, this suicide clause. And, in fact, the clause says that anybody can write to the uh, official designated Euratom contact in each country in Europe, so, you know, whatever country it is, if you're in Sweden or Slovenia or, or Switzerland or Slovakia, does that even exist? Or Luxembourg or Belgium or France or Germany or, or, or Sweden or, did I do Sweden, England, Ireland, whatever. You can write to the designated contact, and, and, I, and we figured out who these designated contacts are, and they're all up on the website on the internet, and I'll put this down in a you know, in the blurb that I write underneath this video. And what I want you, want you to do, each one of you, and it doesn't matter, you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be, although it would be, you know, obviously it's best if you're, if you're like a sort of councillor or somebody with some kind of status, you know, like a, the mayor of Tipperary or, or an MEP or something like that, but don't have to be, it could be anybody. You just have to put your address on it, you have to sort of adapt the template, which I've put up on these various websites which you can find and send them to the person who is responsible for the Euratom directive in your country. Now if you do that they're going to have to do something and I can tell you they I already know they have to do something because I've had a reply back from the UK. I personally have sent this request under the Euratom directive to the UK point of contact and I've had a response to say they're going to do something by the 17th or the 16th of March. 2017, or March 2017, and and my friend uh, um, Sean McGee has done it in Ireland, and they're taking it seriously there. I've written also uh, in my capacity as a as a sort of one-time resident of Sweden to the Swedish out to the Swedish uh, version of this, and we'll do all and and we'll slowly go through all of the countries in Europe and ask them to rejustify because it has to be rejustified primarily in the in the member state. Now it doesn't matter if your member state doesn't have a radi it doesn't have a nuclear power station because because radiation laws exist in all member states not just for nuclear power stations but for for importation of radioactive material from Fukushima for example okay so at the moment there's a law about how how, how many becquerels per kilogram you can have in fish from the Irish Sea or you can have in tea that's imported from from Japan or rice uh, these, lo these regulations are all based on this ICRP model and all of that stuff has to be re-justified re and incidentally while we're on the subject they have to re-justify the development of nuclear weapons because all of that is and, and depleted uranium all of that comes under the same heading uh, in Europe under Euratom so this is, a, this is a fantastic chance to use the letter that I published in Genetics and the earlier uh, heritable damage letter that I wrote with Inga Schmitz Feuerhaker that was published in, in um, uh, another, another quite posh journal, um, Epidemiology and something or another, which, which, which is all in the template letter anyway, it's all there. So that's what I'm asking you to do. And finally, let's say a big thank you to the, to, to the brave editors of the American Genetics Society for publishing this important letter which lays out all of this stuff because the Lancet I can tell you did not in 2015 the Lancet utterly disgracefully 
uh, published a paper about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, about the Hiroshima studies, about how they defined the risk model and how great it was that science had defined the risk model. And this paper was written by, by a number of people, one of whom was Richard Wakeford, who is the ex-head of research of British nuclear fuels. Anyway, so I wrote into The Lancet and I said, look, this is disgraceful. You've got, the, you've got people there who are writing something about radiation who are biased and not to be trusted. And I want you to give me a, a, a small space to write a letter to point this out. And they wrote back and said, no, you're not going to. Right? So then I, I, then I thought, well, blow that. I'm going to submit it anyway. So I wrote a letter and I submitted it. And rather than send it to reviewers, The Lancet sent it to... Richard Wakeford, to the people who wrote this biased and, 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 and ridiculous, dishonest paper. Okay? Of course, they said, you know, this Jack Busby, you know, he's, he's wrong. There's no problem, you know. Uh, and so the Lancet wrote back to me and said, well, we're throwing it out, so we're not going to publish that. Then this year, I was contacted by those independent WHO people in Geneva, who are friends of mine, and they said, what can we do? And so Alexey Yablokov and me and Inga schmitz and Alex Rosen, we wrote a letter to the editor of The Lancet, and the independent WHO sent it to The Lancet, recorded delivery from Geneva, and they didn't get any reply. So this is, like, this is, how, this is how truth is defined in the modern world, okay? It's defined by what you are allowed to say. And in the area of radiation, you're not allowed to say anything. The BBC has got a complete blanket on it. Most of the media have got a complete blanket on it. Anybody who comes in and says anything like, oh, the current risk model is wrong and millions of people are dying, doesn't get a look in. They have various outfits blocking this. Well, anyway, I went rabbit on about all of this. Uh, I, I think I've made the point, and, and briefly to come back to the point, there's now a letter which shows that the basis for the current radiation risk model is dishonest and was, and was fitted up by a load of... Well, it was, it was either dishonestly fitted up or stupidly fitted up in 1973. And it's wrong. And we know it's wrong from all sorts of evidence in the literature, including the work of this guy, Juan Atabe, who, who did a new, new study of the, of the, of the um, Japanese survivors. We know all that. It was put into the, the Royal Courts of Justice court case this summer. And on top of that, we also have the Herit Her Heritable Effects paper of Inga Smith's Firehaka. And so there's adequate new evidence now to, to trigger the suicide clause of the Euratom directives and that's what we're doing and we want you to do it as well if you, if you will because together we can stop this nightmare and we can pull the plug on this monster good, thank you for listening and I'm, I'm sorry it, was, it took longer than I thought I just wanted to be succinct and terse but I, very, I find great difficulty <laughs> in being succinct and terse thank you